I would like to also offer my huge welcome and thanks uh, to Bishop Michael for being here. It is an absolute joy and we've been having a really good chat upstairs. It seemed a shame to end it, but this felt right. very important. So I'm, I'm glad we did and it's, it's really great uh, to be here with you too. And we hope that as we reflect on the experiences of black people in the UK and in the US, looking back and looking forward, we will be able to offer nuggets of hope and also honest conversation and reflection um, as we faithfully look to the future. Mm -hmm. um, I want to start just by saying that, you know, terminology is always tricky and no one term covers everything. So uh, we'll, we'll be using words like black people and white people, uh, African-American and black British and white British, but recognise the limitations of that language. Um, before we start, um, I'd like to just share some stats with you uh, that will hopefully set the tone. So uh, I'm, I'm going to race through 60 seconds worth of stats. They're hard hitting, but they really do set the foundation. So we're in London, and this is significant because 70% of black people in the UK live in London and represent 40% of the population in the capital. Black people comprise of 14% of the population, representing only 8% of the workforce. 35% of black children grow up in poverty. 50% of black families have low income. 28% of homeless people in the UK are black. 38% of, of black children qualify for free school lunches. When black academics get jobs in the university, um, they suffer wage discrimination, making an average of 38,000 compared to 52,000 for their white colleagues. 30% of black women earn less than a living wage. 50% of black workers report feeling they need to censor themselves and behave differently on account of their race. Among trustees and boards of directors, only 6.6% .6 are black people. Black people are more likely to be arrested as a result and stopped and searched than white people, but are less likely to be given an outcome that isn't um, a prison sentence, so an outside court settlement. Black people were prosecuted for drug offences at more than eight times the rate of white people in 2017. Black people comprise 25% of cannabis convictions, despite only making 14% of the population. 50% of black males have their DNA held on police databases. Um, black people are disproportionately likely to be victims of hate crimes. 82% of violent crime in the UK was reported to have racial motivations. Just to set the scene. I, there is so much to talk about, um, Bishop Michael, and um, I think I want to start, really, if you don't mind, with, with just reflecting on, on your life. You know, we, we know from the, from, from the tabloids that you were born in Chicago, grew up in Buffalo, um, that you have uh, slavery, you know, as part of your, your history, mm -hmm. and that you have a real heart for, for justice. I mean, so much so that, you know, campaigning and law was even an attractive pathway for you at one point. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit about the, the, the sort of desire for, for justice and change and where that comes from? And also what you think of these stats that I've just read out. Well, uh, Arshika, thank you. And thank you to everyone for coming out and everyone who made this, this possible. Um, these conversations are important. Mm -hmm. um, um, they really are important um, because often what is left unsaid and not faced um, becomes more pernicious than when it's faced and engaged. Mm. And even if it's difficult to have the conversation, it has the potential for help and healing in the long run. Mm. Um, so thank you, Archdeacon, oh. and, and thank all of you for, for coming, for coming out. Uh, I grew up in the Episcopal Church. Um, it's your church in, in, in the States, and 
Um, and, and grew up, my dad was, was an Episcopal priest and uh, his father was a Baptist preacher, um, a revivalist, um, um, and um, I believe his father's father was as well, although that's a little darker. Um, it's harder to know for sure. Um, but, um, and, and uh, both, both of my parents reared uh, my sister and I, the two of us, in, in the church. We grew up in the womb. We grew up, now again, and um, the statistics are alarmingly similar. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're almost parallel, mm -hmm. and they really are. Um, it's, I could have closed my eyes and thought I was in New York. <laughs> it really pretty much the same stats are similar. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, I grew up in, um, I was born in 1953, so, so, I, so I was really emerging as, as an independent individual probably in the 1960s. Um, and then went off the went off to college and that kind of stuff in the seventies, um, but but I you know I remember um, um, as a little boy uh, that that um, uh, we, my sister and I were serving Coca Colas to a bunch of preachers Daddy had over the house and they were planning something and you know we didn't know what we were little kids and our job was just to bring the Coca Colas and you know whatever it is they were eating and um, bring th that stuff in and serve them and if they needed anything and. Um, and then as time went on, eventually I found out they were planning um, people uh, going from Buffalo to Washington for the March on Washington in 1963. Yeah. So that was the home I grew up in, where, where the church was involved in the life of people that, yeah. um, you, know, the, the, you know, our tradition says that God became flesh in Jesus, yeah. which means he entered our world to transform it. I mean, he didn't just stay up in heaven. He entered our world to transform it. And, and our purpose here on earth is to be engaged as a Christian following Jesus in ways that actually lead to, to a betterment of human life, um, to a realization of justice um, for all people, mm. for everybody. Mm. Um, and so that, so I grew up in that ferment. Mm. Um, I grew up, I remember one time um, during the desegregation of public schools in, in Buffalo, um, um, a part of the issue, at least in America, around segregation, is that segregation was inherently unequal and still is. Yeah. Believe it or not, our schools in America, public schools in America, are as segregated now as they were wow. uh, when Dr. King was working. Yeah. It's, it's reverted. It has actually reverted back. Yeah. Um, and the problem with segregation, aside from it separates people from people, yeah. which is a problem. Yeah. Um, it separates people from people. It also builds in automatic inequities um, because the kids in predominantly black schools are not gonna get the same quality um, and the same things that kids in predominantly white schools um, and, and fairly well-to-do neighborhoods get. It's just a built-in mm -hmm. separate is not equal. Mm -hmm. It's going to be inherently, nine times out of ten, unequal. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, Daddy was involved. There was some desegregation work going on in the schools, and the clergy were involved in leading some of the campaigns. And, and I remember one time he sat, my sister and I, Daddy sat us down, and, um, and he told us um, you know, he might be going to jail in the morning. Um, and I remember my sister said, well, what did you do wrong? What, what, why do you, you know? And, and he kind of, I don't remember what he said, but he explained to us that, you know, sometimes you have to make a sacrifice for that which is right. Mm. Um, so that was the context. I mean, that was just kind of, that was just a given uh, growing up. And so eventually, as I was telling you earlier, um, I kind of uh, used to campaign for different people who were running for office. Um, uh, a guy named Arthur Eve, who was running for the state senate, um, and he lost that first campaign, and then he eventually ended up, and he was representing the black community in, in that day, and a campaign for Robert Kennedy when he, ran, you know, uh, John Kennedy's younger brother, when he ran for the senate and then later ran for president. And, you know, I did my little part. I mean, a kid, so I passed out, you know, you licked envelopes and, and put stamps on them, that kind of stuff. But I did my, so I was always kind of leaning in that direction. And, and thinking that maybe that's the way I would go with my life. And it was while in college, mm. midway through, that, that I eventually had some experiences that kind of moved me and said, you know, um, and, I, and I found myself reading um, in one particular course um, some of the deeper writings of Dr. King, not just the speeches, but, but actually some of the deeper reflective theological things. I mean, Dr. King was a systematic theologian. Um, with a doctorate in systematic theology from Boston University. And so he was a well-trained, well-honed thinker. Um, and you could get that, but you have to go and dig that up. Mm -hmm. It's there, but you have yeah. to dig it up. And I began to realize that, that if uh, maybe a way to have a real impact, mm -hmm. and maybe the way I was supposed to have my impact, you have to be who you are, 
is that maybe being an ordained a priest is a way to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that led to the journey. But all of that was in the context of, of a family. I remember one time I got my father, I don't know what we were, I, I was probably 12 or 13, and he said something, and I kind of said something back, you know, not too much back, because mm -hmm. in those days you didn't say too much back to your parents. <laughs> but I went as far as I could, you know, to get up. And his response to whatever it was, I said, he said, you know, the Lord didn't put you here just to consume oxygen. <laughs> which suggests that you actually are here for a purpose. You, yeah. You're not here just to be a consumer. Yeah. You, are, you are here actually to give, to actually yeah. make a difference. Yeah. Um, and I happen to believe that that's true, that, yeah. that we are actually here to better the creation. The yeah. Jewish tradition has the tradition of tikkun olam, to heal the creation. Yeah. Uh, that's our job. Yeah. Our job isn't just to consume the yeah. oxygen. Our job is actually to make a difference. Yeah. And, and even if it means personal sacrifice yeah. to do it. And, and that's, yeah, absolutely. that's and, the Jesus yeah, way. <laughs> sure. And if we are just consuming the oxygen, as it were, then, right. then we can actually sometimes just be adding to the problem. Right. You know, right. Um, that's, that's the reality. Exactly. Right? You're right. Yeah. So you mentioned Martin Luther King and, and, mm -hmm. and, and also finding nuggets and stories that are often hidden away, you mm -hmm. know, that you've got to kind of root out. Mm -hmm. You know, and the American history is 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 complex, uh, particularly for African Americans. Mm -hmm. You know, from mm -hmm. slavery through to you know the civil rights movement, lynches, you know, mm -hmm. segregation, uh, which yeah. continues. And in many ways, as you say, you mm -hmm. know, it's not been a progression but a regression. Mm -hmm. um, how important then are those stories to root out? And, and why do you think we need to root them out and they're not kind of on the surface already, as it were? You know, in a funny way, they're spiritual stories that must be told. Um, part of the wisdom of the Jewish tradition is that you must tell and repeat the sacred story even in the hardest of times. Um, and, um, and, and part you know, the tradition of Passover and those kinds of things come out of that. Um, because sometimes it's necessary to learn from the past. Um, um, if you know the stories of the past, then you know, then you learn how people were able to creatively transform nightmares into dreams. Mm -hmm. How they were able to carve out in their, they may have been only in their little sphere of influence, they were able to carve out possibilities from all sorts of problems. Mm -hmm. and, and if you, for example, in the, the slave past in, in the American context, mm -hmm. um, the, the slaves were quite ingenious. I mean, they, they had a life that they had to live while Massa was around. Mm -hmm. uh, but when, when Omasa and Missy weren't, weren't around, they had a whole nother life. Mm -hmm. um, even to the point, um, one of the, um, uh, E. Franklin Frazier and other scholars who have looked at the history of the black church in America mm -hmm. have said, you know, there are two levels that you find in the 18th and 19th century. There is the formal visible church, mm -hmm. um, and then there's what they call the invisible institution. Mm -hmm. And the formal, formal church um, was when slaves would go to church with their masters. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, for good or ill, many of those churches were Episcopal churches, actually, um, and in the South in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they, they went to church and did, you know, dutifully whatever they were required to do. And then at night, in the evening, on Sunday evening, they would, as there's no spiritual says, steal away to Jesus. They would steal away to Jesus, and then they would have their own church. Mm -hmm. And when they had their own church, then they sang their own spirituals and their own songs. And that was very often where folk uh, who were trying to find a way to escape planted their escape. Mm -hmm. So that the church, that invisible institution, was actually the womb of taking a problem and creating possibilities silently when nobody was looking. Yeah. Now, if you know that from the past, then you say, okay, if we're in tough circumstances and situations, our job is to take the nightmare and figure out how do we make the dream take the problem and create possibilities, mm. uh, to create new possibilities, mm. to never become enslaved mm. to the problem. Yeah. And if we, get, if we get stuck and enslaved in the problem, then it becomes intractable. Yeah. But, but if you understand that there is a way, if you were, you know, like old mm. folk used to say, one with God is always in the majority. Yeah. Well, if you understand that, then there are creative possibilities mm. and you just got to figure out what they are yeah. and, and work them. Yeah. That's hope from a painful history yeah. that can help you in the present and create a new, a new yeah. future. Wonderful. And that's... Yeah. It's funny, Bishop, I remember being at university. I went to Birmingham University. Uh -huh. Not the American Birmingham. The, the, that's the a different Birmingham. Birmingham. Yeah. That's a whole different <laughs> yeah. Birmingham, yeah. And um, I remember learning about Equiano. 
oh, a, yes, the, the, slave. the first slave who, right. who bought his freedom. Right. And he bought his freedom just up the road from where my university was. So as a, a wide-eyed 18-year-old, I read, you know, exactly what you're saying, that, yeah. you know, he was a man brought up in slavery who, you know, to all intents and purposes, ha purposes had no means right. of breaking those shackles. And yet, mm -hmm. through hard work, through hope and through prayer, you know, mm -hmm. and through opportunities, mm -hmm. you know, he did so. He did. And so, you're, you know, getting out of that slavery, as you say, you know, and looking, looking to the good in those role models can yeah. really empower us. It can um, move you forward. It can move it us can, forward. It yeah. can at least give you the courage to face your yeah. own. Yeah. When you have, when you have no, when you've not experienced hope mm -hmm. yourself, to know that it has existed in the past is to know that it's possible for you. Mm -hmm. And as long as you got hope, that's when old Jesse Jackson ran for president of the United States. This is long before Barack Obama ran for president of the United States back in the, in the late '80s. I think it was the '88 election, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. And his big refrain was, "Keep hope alive. Yeah. Keep hope alive." Yeah, yeah. Bill Clinton ran and uh, yeah. said, came from a town called Hope, Arkansas. He said, a boy from Hope. Yeah. <laughs> Keep hope alive. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, just staying on that theme of, of role models and role models from mm -hmm. the past, you know, of course, there are so many wonderful role models now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm looking at one. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Barack, I Obama, that, Barack Obama is another, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have this narrative, certainly in the UK, that we understand the power of role models. Yeah. Because when you when you look up and you see somebody who either has achieved something incredible or stands for something great, yeah. and they look like you, they possibly right. sound like you, that, that that matters. It does. And, you know, I'm conscious that when you stood up at the royal wedding in front of Her Majesty the Queen and were watched by 1.9 million people, you know, you became one of the biggest role models um, mm. across the world. Mm. Um, what does that feel like? Have you felt the impact of, of being a role model in that way? Uh, yes and no. Um, you know, I'm, and I have to admit, um, the good thing was, I can't I can we can see each other here. I can't see 1.9 billion people. <laughs> I, I just can't imagine what that, it, it's, it's kind of mind boggling. Um, and I was very aware, even in the moment, um, when I was preaching there, there were old slaves there. I was aware of, I mean, I'm not getting mystical on you, but I was just very aware of a whole history mm. and, and the yearnings of, of, of people. Um, and not just black people, but there were, there were some hopes and yearnings that, was, that were on some level embedded even in the couple. Mm. <laughs> we're, we're looking at them as, okay, is there some hope here? Or do, dare we hope? <laughs> you know? and, and even my sermon just being there just me being there mm. um and at one point i did kind of stop and say well if the old slaves could see this mm. <laughs> <laughs> and said, lord have mercy <laughs> and so i was aware very much aware yeah. of of that and and was intentional about what i said mm. um because one i think it's the christian gospel i think it's with jesus i think it's it just i didn't say anything new mm. It was the Christian gospel. Um, it's what Jesus is about. Um, and two, it was to claim that we don't have to, who is it, George Bernard Shaw said, some men see things as they are mm -hmm. and ask why I dream things that never were and ask why not. Yeah. Why not a different kind of world? Yeah. That we must not, we must not submit to the way things are. We, yeah. must, we must not submit. Uh, that's what it is to follow Jesus. He refused to submit to the way things are, even when the devil tempted him. Mm. All those temptations in the, in the, at the beginning of the gospel story, mm. the devil's trying to tempt him into leaving the world the way it is. Mm. You know, and just misuse your power. You know, jump off the temple, let the angels, catch. Just, just that, that's what that's about. Mm. And Jesus has to resist the temptation to simply accept the world as it is mm. and then engage on a ministry that changes it, that works to change it and shows us the way to change it yeah. into something closer to what God had in mind in the first place. Yeah. And, you know, a bit of a, a con controversial question, I suppose. The, the other side, of course, of the, of the role model question uh -huh. is, and I don't know if you've read this book called The, the Good Immigrant. No. No. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, the, the story of The Good Immigrant talks about, you know, you can be of color, you can be black, you know, as long as you're good. 
You know, you're accepted right, right. if you're an archbishop or a right. bishop, or if you're an archdeacon, right. or if you went to private school, or right. if you've been educated, sure. or if you've a gold, a gold medalist. You're the exception. Exactly, <laughs> right. exactly. And so on one level, of course, there is that aspiration mm -hmm. that, we, that we get from role models. But on another level, there is, and perhaps you would disagree, but there's a, almost a line of acceptability mm -hmm. that you have to reach mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, do you, what do you feel about that? Well, you, you, just have to, you just have to keep on. I, I'll, I'll give you an example, and, and this wasn't planned this way, it just kind of unfolded. Um, I was here for, for, for the royal wedding, and um, I was also scheduled to be part of a, a group, uh, an ecumenical group back in the States um, called Reclaiming Jesus, uh, where we were holding a prayer vigil in, in front of the White House, speaking about issues of immigration and, and social justice and going to the White House to do it, to make the point. So it literally, in the, in the span of less than seven days, I mean, I was one thing, one thing here, mm. and then I was back. And part of what has to happen is for people like us, um, um, to, to whom much is given, much is expected. Mm. And so you do have to consistently keep going back to who are you and what do you stand for and what do you believe in? Mm. And you have to keep living out of that. And it's hard, because mm. the temptation to go the other way and just like lay low and just enjoy that. Mm. That's tempting. That's so, seductive. so tempting. Oh, it is. Sure it is. I mean, it really is. But don't, don't be fooled by that. Mm. It's illusory anyway, mm. but don't, so don't be fooled by it. You gotta keep going back to what is it that you stand for and believe in mm. and live out of that. Mm. And so, I mean, it was, it was like I said, I hadn't planned it that way. I mean, it wasn't, it just happened that we had scheduled this and then there were a series of, of, of prayer protest mm. that, that happened around the country. And we had one at our general convention mm. uh, where we went to one of the women's detention centers. This would have been about a month later. Uh, went to a women's detention center on the U.S. border between Mexico and um, Texas. Um, and, and we couldn't get but so far, but these were women whose children had been separated from them. They took their children away from them mm. and separated them. And we took Episcopalians from our general, a couple thousand Episcopalians, and we went to the prayer, I mean, to the, to the state a penitentiary, but not penitentiary, what do you call it, detention center, yeah. and behind barbed wire. This is in America, barbed wire. And women inside, mm. you know, the, the windows are these little, these things like this, you know, because they're escape proof. Um, and, and we prayed and we sang. And I mean, I, I addressed the crowd and said, we do not come here in hatred. We do not come here in anger. Mm. We come here in love. Mm. And love is the mother of justice. Mm. And justice is about doing right by everybody. And it is wrong mm. to separate a mother from her children. Yeah. It is wrong to turn people back at the border just because of the color of their skin. Mm. It is wrong and that is not the American mm. way. Now that was, again, that, that was, um, that was yeah. just a month later. Yeah. So, so you do have to keep going yeah. back. And you, to, yeah, I mean, it's so true, isn't it? I think, you know, when you say it is wrong and when I read these stack, stats, the mm -hmm. stats I read at the beginning, you know, issues of racism, you know, and race, racial discrimination, you know, it's, it's not a feeling. You know, this is a fact. You know, injustice is a fact. Mm -hmm. And until we begin to see it as a fact, mm -hmm. you know, it's our issue and our feeling. Sure. All of us. Uh, yeah. You know, that, that, that actually, you know, is something that we have to deal with. But if we start looking at it, it as a fact, you know, as an injustice, you know, to, mm -hmm. for all of us and to all of us, mm -hmm. we can begin to ask the honest questions and actually reflect in ways that are difficult but really open. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so when you when you say, you know, to separate a mother from her child is wrong. Yeah. Of course, it's wrong, yeah. you know, and everybody knows that that's wrong. Yeah. And that's not about feeling. It's discrimination, you know. Right. And, and, and to some extent, you know, while the whole policy hasn't changed, you know, there are little protests, but there were other ones that were going around around the country. They had to shift the policy slightly. Now, some of it went underground. We know that. But the point is, don't think that what you do doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It may take time, mm -hmm. but, but it can have impact over time. Yeah. Um, and and y the trick is not to give up, yeah. not to quit. Um, and as, as Dr. King tried to teach us over and over, he said, everything you do has got to be about love. Mm -hmm. If it is not about love, yeah. it will degenerate into vengeance. Yeah. It will degenerate into something that doesn't help, mm -hmm. but that actually hurts. Yeah. And so, that, I mean, 
I mean, that, that, that's got it's got to be yeah. both and you yeah. got to be, but you got to yeah. keep at it, but you got to keep at it for the right reason. Yeah. Um, you know, the truth is, I mean, I I can't speak to your context here directly. I'm not here, um, and I wouldn't presume to do that. But I can. But there are parallels, I suspect. Mm. Um, and part of what we in the states are really struggling with, and many of us have been saying over and over again, wait a minute, America, we can be better than this. Mm. That to call on the better angels of our nature. Mm. I mean, not just, but sometimes say, wait a minute, we can be better than this. Mm. Um, um, th th this is not the way. And, we know, and, and you know what? More people will know that mm. than, than will oppose it. And um, if you can call out what I, I mean, I call, there's a sensible center out there of people who are basically people of goodwill and decency. Mm. And when you help folk begin to see, okay, we gotta listen to some hard truths, mm. but we're not listening to the hard truths and facing them so we can all get beaten up. Mm. We're, we're looking at them so that we can figure out how do we all get healed. Mm. And, and in, in the American context, huh? you know, what are, what is the it? What is the it, problem? How would you turn, you know, what terminology would you use to name that? In America? Yeah. Is it racism? Is it institutional racism? Is it inequality? Well, you're going, that's pretty good. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's pretty good. It's, it's all of the above. Oh, yeah, I, th I think it's all of the above. Now, now, to some extent, and again, I don't know, I can, in America, um, I think part of the dilemma and the struggle that's going on right now in America um, <laughs> is a struggle, a fear of the colorizing of America. I mean, it really is. It's a fear of the colorizing. America is becoming more and more a, a nation of colored peoples. Mm -hmm. And it's really only, I mean, I mean, I think 2050 was the demographic year that they were noting when America will be predominantly populated by people, uh, black, brown, um, Asian peoples. I mean, that, that they will, those former minorities, you put them together, that becomes the new majority. Yeah. And so there can be a fear Mm. That can get and and some politicians are preying on that mm. fear. Mm. Um, and now there's all, always I mean when immigration waves happen, again in America there have there's always been resistance to new immigrants. Mm. They're going to take our jobs. They're going to you know that that's been it mm. was true when the Irish first came to America. Mm. It was true in the age. I mean it that some of that's a dynamic of immigration, mm. um, but it's intensified when you add race to it when you mm. add color. Mm. Um, it's not an accident that uh, one of our leaders, now, and, and he shall go unnamed, I will not name him, but um, said that we need fewer um, 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 immigrants um, mm. uh, coming from um, Mexico mm. and, 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 and places like that. Bishop, I and, think you, I think you more know who you coming, mean. I figured you all would get yeah. it. And more coming from Norway. He actually said, we need more from Norway. Mm. Now, now, when you stop and think, what's going on? Now, people in Norway are fine people. Nothing wrong with people from Norway. But, how come you can't? And if you look at the immigration wave coming from Mexico, you know who's coming there? They're not only people coming from Latin America, from Honduras and Nicaragua and El Salvador, um, and in Latin America, Haitian refugees are coming. That's that's their entryway. And people are coming from Somalia are actually coming through that route. So it's a colored wave. Mm -hmm. It's not about immigration. It's about race. Yeah. It, there is no question about that. Mm. Now, the average American person pro may not be consciously thinking of that, mm. but the net effect is the same. Yeah. <laughs> you see? Yeah. And so I do think for the U.S., the fear of race mm. and of being overwhelmed, I think that's partially going on. Mm. And, and a number of commentators had said, we didn't, it's, I didn't anticipate this. Part of this has been triggered when Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. Mm. And there was a black family, listen to this, a black family living in the White House. <laughs> if you think about that, I mean, it actually, you know, you think, what's going on there? There was yeah. all of a sudden, oh, we at, wait a minute now, We're not, we can't go too far with this. Mm. Are we about to be overwhelmed? Mm. That is part of yeah. the dynamic. Yeah. And given America's racial history, yeah. that's part of the dynamic. Yeah. So how do you move past something like yeah. that? One, you've got to name it. Yeah. And then two, then you've got to say, okay, everybody, we can do better than this. Mm. So how do we work together? We've got to face it, but how do we work together 
to create a just and humane society. One, we do have to knit together relationships with each other. Mm. I mean, I don't, do not minimize the role <laughs> of people actually knowing other people as human beings and children of God yeah. and being in relationship with yeah. each other. And churches can help to facilitate that. Yeah. And, but don't just stop at relationships. Yeah. Then begin to think, okay, now how can we make our contribution together uh, to improve the economic and the social conditions that keep children from getting becoming all that God intends for them to be mm. and, and keeps the inequities and yeah. the injustices going. Yeah. You can't solve everything, yeah. but identify something that yeah. you And then people working together, mm. uh, black folk and white folk, mm. working together, doing their unique roles, mm. um, but working together because we refuse to submit to the way the world is. Yeah. We want a different society. We yeah. want a different Britain, and we're going to work together to make it happen. Yeah. We're going to be honest about where we messed up, but we don't have to stay stuck there. Yeah. That's the devil tempting you in the garden to leave it the way it is. Yeah. And guess that? No, no, we're going to follow Jesus. And we're going to do something different. Yeah. And anyway, that's... Well, you know, we might yeah. unpack some of that a little bit more, in a okay. bit more detail. I think mm -hmm. um, just hearing what you were saying about relationships, uh, there's a famous American comedian, I won't name her, but she, she says, you know, every white person should have a black friend. And not like a hi, how are you, goodbye yeah, a friend, real but a real proper <laughs> black friend, which removes fear, mm -hmm. you know, fear of the other, mm -hmm. and begins to, to ha break down barriers, and then one can have honest conversations. Right. You know, and so it's looking in the mirror and saying, well, actually, do I? And, you know, she would go so far as to say the onus is on the white person to have, to have, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make those connections. Mm -hmm. It just reminded me because you were talking about relationships. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I was reflecting on as you were speaking, uh, was the, the, the British context. Uh -huh. um, and you know, the stat I gave at the beginning about um, the concentration in London, mm -hmm. particularly of, of black yeah, people. I didn't know that. And so yeah. we have a statistic, which is that you know 25% of people born in London now are of dual heritage, at least dual heritage. Okay. So we are, we are becoming sure. mi way more multicultural. Oh, yeah. And I think it's being reflected you know, in, our, in our younger generation and their mm -hmm. outlook as well. Mm -hmm. you know, there's still a lot to do. Mm -hmm. But um, if I may, let's, let's, let's just concentrate on the young people for a little while, mm -hmm. because our stats um, are, are very similar, you know, in terms of school and education, right. which you've mentioned, in terms of op opportunities, in terms of youth violence, mm -hmm. you know, and the increase of gang culture. And, you know, there is the complexity, of course, of poverty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't necessarily think the two are the same, uh, and I don't think, you know, that just because one is poor, these things are going to happen. I think, yeah. I think that there is a, you know, there is separation to be had there. Mm. But it, but, the, but the, 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 the poverty aspect does add a nature of complexity. It does. It does. So, so when we look at young people, and we look at particularly young black people and some of the mm. statistics that are arising, what, what, what would you say into that situation about what we can do to kind of, to help make the, the experience of young people mm -hmm more positive and to give proper opportunities, particularly to young black boys as we mm -hmm. look to the future? I think, I think, it, I think it takes an all-out social intervention yeah. in the lives of children. Mm -hmm. um, one, of the, um, one of my mentors is Marion Wright Edelman, uh, the founder of the Children's Defense Fund in, in the state, and, and we've, one of their offices is actually located in the Episcopal Church Center in New York. Um, I, I twisted her arm, I said, Marion, please, could you put one of your places in the Episcopal Center, and, and they did, and they're there. And part of that is because what Marion Wright Edelman stands for in the Children's Defense Fund in the state is a children's agenda, mm -hmm. um, an agenda for the emancipation of children, mm -hmm. and with a particular focus, certainly on black and brown children, but, but we got a lot of white children in poverty in the states, and mm -hmm. children who are stuck in unremitting cycles of poverty. Mm. To, to break that cycle, there has to be a profound and serious social intervention mm. that goes from the earliest days of, of prenatal um, to the earliest ch earliest days that that child is in this world. You've got to have the, re the in just the normal stuff that children are supposed to have. Mm. If it, you've got to help parents to provide that, mm. um, but you have to pro provide that if they can't. Mm -hmm. um, and that ought to be provided for every child, mm -hmm. um, no matter what their social economic class. Those who can afford it can get it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they get it. But uh, in ch poor children, children coming from impoverished backgrounds and families, aren't necessarily going to get it. Yeah. Um, and so a, a, a profound social intervention on children. And I think that's where you can actually make an intervention on poverty strategically. Uh, Marion Wright Element often says 
that you don't get a lot of traction when you keep talking about and poor people. Because mm -hmm. people's hearts don't go out to poor people. But children, children, you might, you can actually get the same thing done just by focusing on the child because who hates children? I mean, it, it, mm. you know, well, I mean, you know what I mean? It's just kind of, well, if you have some of your own, there's some days. When, but, 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 but children actually, there, there's something in human beings that you don't want to see a child suffering. That's not, you just know that's not right. Um, you know, we're older, we're grown, you know, but not a child. Yeah. And so strategic intervention from uh, prenatal to early childhood um, on through. Um, unfortunately, and I don't know about here, but, but in, in the states, in North Carolina, where I, I still live in, in North Carolina, mm -hmm. where I was the bishop for a number of years, um, in North Carolina, um, the fourth grade, end of the year um, academic uh, testing records are how the state can calculate the number of beds it's going to need in the state prisons. Yeah. You can actually, you can, it, it's almost, it, it's horrible to say, it, it, it's almost fixed yeah. by the fourth grade, yeah. which means you need intervention early. Yeah. Um, and it needs to be, I mean, you actually need prenatal for medical, yeah. uh, for just health reasons, um, and helping folk with parenting. And, mm. um, but that child needs to be in educational environments, both at home and, and in daycare, early childhood, so that they're hearing language, they're learning to think, they're learning the kinds of things that's necessary for any child's development, yeah. so that you don't hit that fourth grade and they're already lost, yeah. especially with boys um, and, and, and our black yeah, boys. Yeah, and are they lost? I mean, uh, you know, no, not completely. Yeah, they can still be. Yeah, I think. Ch but yeah, it's you're harder. right. Who, who doesn't like children? Everybody loves children. Yeah. Most people love. Most people love children. Most of us. You yeah, know. on our good but, days. But where, where where it feels like we're at in the UK is that most people don't like youths. You know, it, it, it almost does this stark right. kind of. You know, and and I think the the age at which. And this is particularly for young black boys, you know, the mm -hmm. age at which, you know, they are, they become a problem or even feared can be as young as eight or nine. Right. You know? You're right. Yeah. And, you know, that, in my mind, that's, that's still a child. Scary. Yeah. You know, it is so scary. They're a child. Uh, yeah, yeah. And statistics show that they're less likely to give second chances, right. give, be given second chances, so right. more likely to be excluded from school. Right. And then once you get down that road, it becomes so much harder. And as you say, maybe not lost, but a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it seems like such a, a difficult question to ask, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. the answer involves so much. But let know. me give you some specifics. Yeah, please. Specifics. There's no reason, and I, again, I don't know how you're structured here, but there is no reason in the world that every church can't adopt a school. No reason. We got, I, I guess, I, I mean, I've seen Anglican churches all over the place, so I know you got a bunch of them. So uh, there's no reason that every church adopt a school and make sure that that school has everything that it needs for children's well-being. That's just a little thing, but volunteers and whether it's tutoring stuff or whatever, that, that's something we can actually do. Mm. Um, there, there is no reason. I was, I was uh, my, my last um, term as a parish priest was in, in Baltimore, in inner city Baltimore. Um, and um, I was in, I was actually in that we served, the church was in the neighborhood um, where they filmed the television show Homicide. Mm. Um, and, and so that, it was a, and we spent much of our time um, engaging with children and one of the things that we did we discovered that the most vulnerable hours for kids were after they left school yeah. and up to about eight o'clock at night that yeah. that was the vulnerable because you know if they had a working mother or working yeah. parents they weren't home so they weren't getting the kind yeah. so nobody was watching them do their um homework nobody was making sure they ate nobody was making sure they had recreation that was helpful you yeah. know i mean that kind of, just yeah. the kind of i mean we're not talking about extraordinary things but if it's not there yeah. it does stunt development yeah. and so we had our after school academy wasn't just tutoring from four to five yeah. eventually it became from four to eight yeah. And I mean that again, the, again, that takes a little bit more to do that. But that churches can do that mm. or actually you just have to staff it and develop it. Mm. That's a strategic intervention. I've got to tell you, there are kids who were in the, and we started it when I got a retired teacher, a kindergarten teacher. I said, look, we got these kids. I'm seeing them. They're out. They're all out here. Mm. Uh, so let's get some of these little kids. You're a kindergarten teacher. I don't know what to do with them, but you do. So <laughs> let's mm. get you. And God bless her. She really did. did. And we started with a bunch of little kids. 
and she just started reading to them, and it mm. l later developed into something. Mm. Those kids are now adults, mm. and I don't know where all of them are, but, but one of them is a nurse I know in Raleigh. I see her mm. periodically. Yeah. Another one is a master sergeant in the United States um, yeah. in, in the Air Force, the U.S. Yeah. Air Force. I mean, some of those kids, and I know what they came from. Yeah. We couldn't save, we can't save everybody. You no. can't, but you can save somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and that's our yeah. job. F yeah. Find that one kid yeah. to get, help them make it. And, mm. and, and churches, believe it or not, God bless us, church communities can do this. Mm. We actually can. Mm. And I think churches could be mobilized yeah. to do that yeah. more. And more. And it's funny, so in, the, in, the, in, in our context, the Ministry of Education yeah. has said that, you know, that schools should be open in holidays and in those crucial area, at hours Tremendous. for after school and before right. parents get home. Um, so, Good for so, you all. Yeah. And I think just one thing to reflect, you know, the church is part of an institution and, mm -hmm. you know, we still have a lot to do in terms of inclusion. And it's one of those things where if you know that this is important, then you're doing it. Right. And, and it's almost, it's easy, you know, f to, to say these things to people who already have a heart for issues mm -hmm, of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the church isn't the same for everybody. And, and I wonder how much, and I think I, you know, I totally agree with you. Yeah. You know, the church can do amazing things and we mm -hmm. are called to do that, mm -hmm. you know. But I would also go so far as to say, you know, we, we need to make space actually mm -hmm. for white people to have the difficult conversations, mm -hmm. which actually mean change. Yeah. You know, it will mean talking about the identity and experience and the history of the things that we've said, as uncomfortable mm -hmm. as they are. Mm -hmm. It will mean reflecting on, you know, their identity and the privilege that they may or may not perceive to have, whether mm -hmm. that's reality. Sure. You know, there's open and honest conversations. And what will happen, you know, if we see more black people in leadership? if we have more black role models, mm -hmm. if we see more black women doing things. Because obviously if that happens, it means that the places that are available will need to be shared at senior mm -hmm. levels. Mm -hmm. And so it means giving that up too. There's a, there's a whole kind of, you know, sure. a, a whole narrative of conversation yeah. that we are only beginning to have in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, and it feels to me like in the UK, we're a little bit more siloed and, and, a, and a little bit more apologetic about issues of race. Um, than the states. I mean, it's a massive generalization. Believe me, your cousins that. across the pond is pretty much the same thing. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> it's there not you that, are. Yeah, it's not that similar. Yeah, yeah. It really is. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm conscious that we, we don't have yeah. much time left. And oh. I, yeah, it's flown by, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has, by. actually. And so I just wondered whether you, you know, w wanted to end with anything in particular as we reflect on 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 issues of race, particularly in this context in the states, and and particularly as you know, two clergy people sitting here yeah. with our love for God and our love for all yeah. people, you know, what you might want to leave us with as we look, f you know, look back and also look forwards, and and you, and, you have, and we haven't got long, so and, you know, oh, oh, it's a massive <laughs> massive oh, question. Oh, is it has yeah. yeah, we got long. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I really do. I, I, don't give up. I mean, that the temptation is to. It is so enormous, there's so much, and I can't do anything. That's the, that's the temptation, and, and yet all that does is leave things the way they are. Um, and so to identify what is it that I can do or we can do, um, on the one hand, to really improve human relationships, mm -hmm. to really, you know, I mean, I, actually, I like, I, I, know who you, I know the comedian you're talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and to really create context for human relations. Again, that's something churches can do. Yeah. That is something that churches can do. Um, what can we do? And then what can we do to improve uh, the greater condition? And that can be whether it's involvement with, with, with people who are doing work with kids or someone else, or engagement in public policy kinds of things. Whatever it is, something. Mm. We can't do everything, but we can do something. Mm. And if we all do something, everything can change. Mm. That's real. Yeah. Um, and so um, I, I just, my, my encouragement is don't give up and don't quit. Yeah. Don't quit, because the truth is this is God's work. And as St. Paul said, with God before us, who can be against us? I'm into yeah. that. Yeah. All right. Can we give Bishop Michael oh. a huge <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, my friend.